You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is September 3rd, 2021, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Imaging in Pediatric Allergy. Our presenter is Dr. Ben Aziz. He's a third-year resident in Diagnostic Radiology at the University of Missouri Kansas City School of Medicine in Kansas City, Missouri. All right, welcome everyone to Conferences Online Allergy on September 3rd, 2021. Um, This morning we will have uh, two presentations. The first will be by Dr. Ben Aziz, um, and he's going to be speaking on uh, imaging in pediatric allergy. Um, Dr. Aziz is in the diagnostic radiology program. He's a a resident there um, at University of Missouri, Kansas City. So we're grateful that he would take some time out of his busy schedule and be with us and give us this presentation today. Um, With that, we'll turn the time over to you. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, And thank you guys uh, for all having me here. Um, This is going to be, I know you guys have these recorded, so it's going to be actually pretty similar to um, uh, the previous lectures that have been given. Uh, They were really good slides and I didn't want to fix something that wasn't broken. So, um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm one of the uh, PGY3 um, radiology residents here. And so um, this uh, presentation has been a good um, review and learning experience uh, for me. So hopefully it's, it's kind of a, kind of the same for you guys. So um, we'll talk about uh, imaging and pediatric allergy. Um, a decent amount of it is also uh, mimics to um, allergy as well, so uh, not necessarily things that um, you would uh, necessarily have to uh, deal with on your own, but uh, important things to consider that uh, can make the diagnosis difficult. So um, we'll, we'll get started. Uh, we'll talk a, a decent amount about allergic sinusitis, some of the uh, airway diseases, uh, some respiratory mimics, and that, uh, mimics and um, some of the anatomic variants, um, mainly with uh, vascular anomalies that can kind of uh, simulate these uh, these symptoms. So, uh, so first thing that we'll we'll kind of touch is uh, sinonasal disease. Um, so, uh, it's a really common thing that we see uh, with. Um, Things that are affecting the paranasal sinuses, um, and this can cause, uh, you know, allergic type symptoms, um, or if it's present long enough and severe enough, uh, it can uh, result in kind of a chronic cough. And so that's kind of one of the more uh, common complaints in uh, in pediatric allergy patients. So just a little bit about uh, the physiology. Um, and kind of structure of the paranasal sinuses. You guys probably know this a little bit better than I do, but um, uh, the paranasal sinuses are uh, pretty important in terms of uh, filtering, humidifying um, the air uh, that comes in um, lined by respiratory epithelium. Uh, you've got uh, a bunch of cilia that are going to be uh, kind of pushing this uh, this incoming air or, or anything uh back into the uh, GI tract uh, via the nasopharynx. Um, and you can see kind of a, a graphic here uh, with uh, on this lateral view here. Well, on this frontal, you've got the uh, nasal turbinates and you have the maxillary sinus. And so um, you have this kind of uh, maxillary uh, processor function that allows a lot of this, um, the uh, mucus from the maxilla uh, bilateral maxilla to come into the um, kind of nasal turbinates, um, and uh, just kind of an aside with uh, with a lot of these um, uh, procedures nowadays to to treat uh, some of this more chronic sinusitis. Um, uh, I know that uh, previously um, there was a lot of surgery done to kind of either unroof this maxillary sinus or to um, maybe just kind of hollow out this entire area to allow this uh, communication to be more open. Um, But the physiology is a little bit more confusing, um, and uh, it seems that it's not quite so much uh, gravity-dependent, but um, 
that they're uh, this kind of opening into the middle turbinate is kind of uh, kind of a key a key spot um, from what I understand. Um, so a little bit about sinonasal uh, development. So the uh, paranasal sinuses will kind of develop in a uh, normal fashion, um, pretty much in the same way every time. Um, so the the first two that'll that'll develop are the maxillary and ethmoid sinuses, um, and those will be aerated at birth, and they can usually be seen kind of around. Uh, the age of three months on on imaging, um, and kind of right around that area at about three months, the sphenoid sinuses kind of start to develop, um, and those will kind of uh, take a little bit more time to mature. Uh, then and then finally, the the frontal sinuses will, will develop, and those really don't um, start uh, developing with any significance until about uh, you know later in the in the uh, early decade uh, of life, so around, uh, you know, seven to ten years of age. Um, so uh, you can have a lot of different uh, issues that can affect sinusoidal development, so congenital abnormalities, um, obviously there are craniofacial dysplasias or um, dystocias that can affect the, the sinuses just like it can affect any of the other skeletal structures of the uh, the face and, and head. Um, you can have uh, variability within the uh, paranasal sinuses themselves, uh, causing differences in aeration as well. So, um, you know, there's contrabullosa. Um, you can have these kind of uh, enlarged nasal turbinates. Um, you can have the uh, these differences in, in uh, aeration of uh, the on onati cells, um, which it can cause issues with the optic nerve, holler cells, which are uh, aerated cells, the maxillary sinuses, which can uh, kind of disrupt uh, the osteomyoidal units as well. Um, and then obviously you have all these other things like inflammatory uh, reactions, uh, Trauma is a big thing, especially in, in younger patients. Um, and then less likely, but uh, almost uh, more severe are some of these neoplastic uh, uh, causes as well. Um, but 40% uh, of children uh, with sinusitis uh, will have some type of uh, history of, of an allergic response. So whether it be uh, asthma, which is more common, uh, you can have uh, immunodeficiencies or uh, some more severe things like cystic fibrosis. So this is just uh, some imaging of the uh, perinasal sinuses. So we kind of talked about the um, ethmoid and maxillary sinuses um, developing first. And so you can see kind of on these one and eight month uh, images right here, uh, these are the maxillary sinuses right here on either side, and you can see this at eight months as well. Um, and you can kind of start to see uh, maybe a little bit of the ethmoid sinuses right here. Oh, whoops, sorry. Ethmoid sinuses right here and here, um, a little bit more developed. Um, this is part of the kind of uh, osteomyoidal complex right here, but uh, some of these ethmoid sinuses uh, up here starting to develop. Um, and then kind of when we get down uh, later, really hard to see the sphenoid sinuses on, on this uh, three-year image. We can kind of see it a little bit better later, but uh, around seven years, um, you're really starting to get um, more development of, of the paranasal sinuses. They're really kind of standing out a little bit better. And then uh, on this lateral view right here, you can see there's the sphenoid sinus back here. Um, you can see some of this uh, aeration within the, uh, the um, nasal um, osteomyoidal uh, complex as well, and um, at 15, you can really see these frontal sinuses developing really well right here. So, um, let's see here. <clears throat> so, some contributors to sinonasal disease, we kind of talked about these a little bit before. Um, you can have bony anatomical variations, um, which um, can affect the uh, mechanics of the paranasal sinuses. Um, these are common uh, causes of recurrent sinusitis. And then you can kind of think of more of these uh, allergic responses, so IgE-mediated uh, rhinitis. Um, and uh, the 
immune mediated uh, responses are generally more um, more uh, severe than uh, kind of these uh, non-allergic ones. Um, and so you'll see a reflection of that on, on imaging as well. Uh, not so much on the radiographs, but when you kind of get more into CTs and MRs, uh, you can kind of see, uh, see some more significant changes there. Uh, and just a little bit of a, um, uh, a list of things that can kind of contribute to the sinonasal disease, um, you know, broken down into these two categories is what was, was a little bit more helpful for me, but um, thinking of it as increased production or decreased clearance. Um, so increased production, uh, you have all of these uh, IgE-mediated um, cystic fibrosis, uh, obviously your uh, local blood supply and hydration state are, are big things, uh, direct uh, effect to the the mucosa with radiation, some type of medications perhaps, uh, tobacco is a really big thing as well, uh, smoke inhalation, um, and then you have impaired mucosal clearance. So uh, smoke inhalation uh, can cause uh, impairment of the cilia themselves, um, some bony abnormalities, tumors, foreign bodies. Um, this is more of kind of a mechanical type uh, uh, decrease in, in the clearance. So just a quick mention on um, general mention on uh, imaging in sinusitis. So uh, and more so with with pediatric uh, imaging. Uh, obviously, there's this big uh, campaign uh, called Image Gently and Image Wisely, which uh, are really trying to limit uh, limit the radiation dose, uh, not just in uh, pediatric population but in adults as well. Um, so, you know, there's there's more of a uh, a reason to to get a radiograph uh, in children. Uh, obviously, CT is um, a little bit more of a radiation dose than uh, than a radiograph. Um, in a lot of cases, uh, we'll find out here in a second that uh, maybe not so much, especially with these uh, newer methods. Um, and then MR is not really uh, really ionizing as well, uh, at all, but um, you know it's there's some cons to that as well. Um, so radiographs themselves uh, not very accurate. Uh, you can't really see a whole lot on radiographs as we could see on those those previous images. Um, you will be able to see some significant opacification of the sinuses. Uh, maybe you can see some type of air fluid levels, um, the maxillary sinuses, and uh, the frontal sinuses are generally a little bit easier to see, um, but it would be very difficult to catch any um, significant change in the ethmoid or, or sphenoid sinuses. Unless you have a, a lateral view, then maybe you can catch some opacification and air fluid levels in the sphenoid sinus. Um, CT uh, is, is obviously uh, much better, and uh, basically what's happening with CT, uh, if you guys aren't aware, um, in terms of the acquisition of the image, uh, we're, we're using a helical uh, X-ray. So it's basically you've got a patient on a on a table, um, as I'm sure you're you're aware, um, and there's a kind of a donut, uh, and that's a rotating X-ray uh, that's basically just shooting X-rays in a in a 360 degree view around the patient, and uh, there's a detector that is directly opposite of that. Uh, x-ray uh, generator, if you will. So uh, it's kind of circling around the patient and uh, now, you know, uh, CTs are done in, you know, a matter of seconds as opposed to, you know, minutes previously. Um, but it, if you can imagine those x-rays, you're, you're shooting a bunch of radiation and it's going in a circle around the patient and it's getting it in multiple slices. So um, while that does uh, add to the radiation dose, uh, it gives you a lot better anatomic uh, resolution of the structures and uh, it can really, really help in assessing those, uh, those sinuses. And then finally MR, not generally the, the first step in um, imaging, but uh, we'll we'll talk about this in a little bit, but if you're worried a little bit more about uh, complex uh, or complicated sinusitis where there might be involvement of some uh, structures beyond the sinuses, uh, things that you might be worried about like the uh, 
the orbits, the optic nerves, the brain itself, um, or the uh, uh, surrounding neurovasculature, then uh, MR would be much better at uh, kind of delimit- uh, delineating between just sinus disease versus uh, invasion um, into some of these other structures. Um, so uh, indications for imaging, uh, if someone's got failed medical therapy, if there are complicated uh, sinusitis, or um, if uh, these patients have been dealing with sinusitis and they've been evaluated by a surgeon and they will proceed with uh, uh, operative management, um, uh, we do a lot of preoperative evaluation of the sinuses to uh, uh, kind of help the, the surgeons uh, figure out exactly how they want to approach that procedure. Um, so uh, radiographs, we did, uh, oops, sorry, radiographs, we did talk about um, how uh, the benefits are, they're really quick, they're really easy, uh, really available. Every, uh, you know, kind of podunk hospital or clinic's got an x-ray machine. Uh, not everyone has an MR. Um, so it's uh, it's an easy test to attain, uh, and we talked about how uh, it's really pretty poor in in localizing where the sinusitis or the most severe uh, location of the sinusitis is. Uh, you can't really get a good look at the osteomeatal complexes, um, and they're very uh, as you'll see with with all of these imaging studies, but um, more so in, in radiographs. They're they're really difficult. Uh, with, with younger children because they're always they're moving around, can't really get a good um, look, and a lot of uh, radio radiographs, uh, X-rays. Um, it's really important in getting the correct positioning, not so much the motion, but the correct positioning. And so you can see these four different images right here. Uh, we have a Caldwell image, so that's basically directly kind of on FOSS. You're looking at the patient straight on, um, and so you can see the uh, maxillary sinuses, the frontal sinuses, the ethmoids, submento vertex. So this is uh, kind of a um, an angled view. Uh, this and the waters views are kind of similar, it's just that the uh, head is tilted in a different direction. Um, and so you can see on the submento vertex, you can really see these sphenoid sinuses back here. Uh, so basically, it's, it's almost kind of like you're looking uh, uh, from almost the head down <clears throat> at the patient, and um, you're getting kind of an angled view. Uh, this one, you're kind of looking at the patient from uh, uh, like the chin up almost, and so you can see them kind of extending their their chin up, and uh, this is one of the more common views in uh, assessing the peritonasal sinuses, at least on radiographs, so get a really good view of the frontal sinuses here and the maxillary sinuses. And then obviously a lateral view can really help you kind of uh, take a look at the frontal sinuses, uh, if there's an air fluid level there, or the sphenoid sinuses. It can give you a decent look at the maxillary sinuses, but because there's uh, the uh, nasal bone uh, that's kind of projecting over uh, it might be difficult to see uh, some of that opacification, but uh, the sphenoid and, and frontal sinuses are, are pretty well looked at on the on the lateral view. Oops. So we'll kind of go through a case here real quick. Um, so this is a three-month-old with chronic cough, um, and as we talked about earlier with um, the normal development uh, in terms of age and timing, of the sinuses, uh, at about three months, um, the uh, maxillary and ethmoid sinuses should be fairly well developed. You should be able to see them on, on the radiograph, uh, and the sphenoid sinuses are kind of starting to form, but not really well seen on the radiograph. Um, but as we can see here, there is pretty much complete opacification of the bilateral maxillary sinuses. And so this is just a kind of an image with, uh, with uh, lines drawn where the maxillary and ethmoid sinuses are. And, you know, you can see some opacification up here of the ethmoid sinuses. Maybe we're just not seeing them too well, but uh, for sure you can see that there is opacification of the, uh, of the uh, maxillary sinuses. So next case here, we have a 17-year-old uh, with chronic cough, um, and just uh, talking about our views, uh, one of the more common ones is the uh, Waters view, so uh, this is going to give us a good look at the uh, frontal maxillary sinuses. Um, uh, the 
left maxillary sinus, uh, you can see is a little bit more opacified than the right. Bilateral frontal sinuses actually look pretty decent, but this is kind of the normal right maxillary sinus, and then this is a kind of opacified, opacified left maxillary sinus. And this is just a comparison with the uh, normal waters view. So you can see, uh, where did my mask go? Okay, there's uh, bilateral frontal sinuses are, are open. Bilateral maxillary sinuses are uh, symmetrically um, opacified. So, I mean, they're, they're open as well. Um, on this side, you can see that the left is completely different and uh, almost completely opacified. Uh, compared to this normal image on the on-screen left. And an important point to know, and you guys probably already know this, but um, there's a significant variation of the sinuses. Um, and so you can see, well, you know, these frontal sinuses here look pretty, pretty symmetric and pretty open. And you might say, well, is there some disease right here in the right frontal sinus? Mm -hmm. um, the answer to that is, is no. Um, and uh, just kind of an aside is uh, the frontal sinus is actually one of the um, more uh, unique characteristics on any uh, given skull. So it's like, um, I guess this is not a great example, but it's akin to like a snowflake, right? No two snowflakes are the same. That's kind of similar with the frontal sinuses. So that's actually something that um, we use in uh, neuroimaging uh, to make sure we're looking at uh, the correct patient. So uh, we run into issues where sometimes they image a patient and they accidentally put it under, you know, a different patient name, a uh, different patient folder, and so they send it over to us. And um, I had a case about four months ago where um, it was a little bit more obvious, the patient, uh, and this is an adult patient, but the patient had a head bleed, and so, uh, there was a follow-up CT head, and uh, the head bleed wasn't there, which could very well happen, but um, the CT head didn't really look the same either, and um, just taking a look at the frontal sinuses, uh, one of the patients had just um, kind of under-pneumatized frontal sinuses, and one of the patients had really, really well-defined large frontal sinuses, and so that's not something that will change over the course of a day or two. Uh, so we knew it wasn't the right patient, and sure enough, it, they accidentally put it, uh, the text accidentally put it under under a different folder. So, um, you know, that's just kind of an aside, but uh, the frontal sinuses are, are pretty unique and, and uh, uh, can look pretty different. So uh, CT of the sinuses, uh, gold standard in, in imaging, obviously, um, it's a lot easier. The CT is more widely available than MR. Um, it really gives you a, a really good look at the anatomy, uh, the uh, osseous structures. Uh, MR is not really good at looking at uh, skeletal structures, the osseous structures, but CT is very, very good uh, at uh, with that resolution. Um, and so you can really get a good look at the anatomy, the variations, um, and you can really see a uh, solid amount of uh, pathology as well with um, mucosal thickening or uh, how severe uh, that uh, sinusitis is. Um, so those are some of the benefits. Some of the limitations are um, that the uh, there's limited assessment of um, the complications of uh, the sinusitis uh, that they have. So you might be able to see that that they have uh, maxillary and sphenoid sinusitis because uh, you can see some mucosal thickening. But on CT, when you have abrupt changes in uh, density of tissue, so you've got brain right next to the bone, um, CT doesn't know, uh, at least with the algorithms and kind of compiling all those different x-ray images, CT doesn't know that, you know, brain is right here, bone is right here. All it knows is that there's different density tissue right here and different density tissue right there. And so at those interfaces, there is um, a term that we call, uh, which is uh, called volume averaging. So you go from a really dense to a really high density uh, structure like bone to a really kind of low density structure like brain um, right at that interface. CT, the algorithms uh, with the computer when it's reconstructing that image is trying to 
uh, bridge the gap, if you will. And so uh, what results is that some of that bone might appear a little bit lower dense and some of that brain might appear higher dense, higher density. So if there is some extension of that sinusitis, some of the complications, say if some uh, a patient has uh, meningitis, for example, and there's some component right there next to the sinuses, you can't really see that very well on, on CT. And um, the uh, um, last point here, predicting symptom improvement after uh, functional endoscopic sinus surgery, uh, we wouldn't really be able to do that with, with CT. Um, like we mentioned, it's, it's good for preoperative evaluation and how, does, how the surgeons want to approach that procedure, but doesn't really give us anything about how the patient will do afterwards. And then finally, MR imaging. Um, so the big thing in pediatric population is the lack of ionizing radiation. So you're not shooting x-rays at a patient and potentially uh, increasing their cancer risk. Um, you are really bumping up your accuracy, uh, not only your sensitivity, but your specificity in identifying uh, some of those complications, such as meningitis, um, for the reasons that we just discussed previously. Um, and the limitations uh, we discussed as well, so can't really see bones very well, so you can't assess the, uh, the skeletal uh, structures around the sinuses, and uh, they're not as widely available uh, there's an increased cost, uh, obviously, for, for everyone at, at Children's Mercy. It's a great hospital, one of the best in the nation. You will have the availability there. Um, that cost is still an issue, um, but if you really need it, uh, you can always get it there. But if if some of you are, are planning on practicing in uh, a uh, smaller area, this is definitely something to consider. So uh, these next couple images here are... Um, really just uh, uh, discussing uh, a concept that uh, I'm sure you guys have heard of, but uh, it's called the uh, appropriateness criteria. Um, so uh, there is a, um, a website, uh, and there's a link down here at the bottom, um, with the ACR, the American College of Radiology, um, which they basically have every single uh, condition or uh, thing that you might want to order an image for, and if you search it up, it can tell you how appropriate is uh, the study, and it, it can kind of guide you in uh, what you need to uh, order. So uh, in this case right here, this is a, a if you've got a child with a, a persistent or recurrent sinusitis, um, here's the option right here. You can look for children with persistent, recurrent, or chronic sinusitis. It's not responding to treatment. So in this case, uh, CT of the peritonasal sinuses without contrast is your best bet um, in terms of uh, how appropriate it is. And you can see the rating scale here at the bottom, one through three, not really appropriate, four to six can be, and then seven through nine is usually appropriate. So really, peritonasal sinuses without contrast is kind of the route to go. And this is um, uh, recurrent sinusitis without complications. So you'll see that MR we talked about earlier, it's kind of better at picking up some of those complications. Um, and then x-rays, just not great at all, as we talked about before. So complicated sinusitis, this kind of change, changes things a little bit. So you've got uh, orbital or intracranial complications that you're suspecting. Uh, CT, perinasal sinuses, still great. Uh, a CT head with contrast, also really good. And if you guys are really worried about it and you don't want to um, order the MRI, uh, you would order both of these because the um, the actual acquisition of the image uh, is different. So if you get a CT paranasal sinus, um, and you guys might have already seen this or you might see this in the future, um, if you just get a CT paranasal sinus, uh, the uh, slice thickness um, is really good at uh, giving you a look at the sinuses, but it really throws off uh, the detail of the brain. So you would need to get a CT head if you're worried about any uh, intracranial uh, complications. So these would be ordered together. Um, but you can see uh, previously MRI wasn't super helpful for recurrent sinusitis. Um, that jumps up with complicated sinusitis. And this is uh, 
because of those uh, intracranial complications. You can maybe see meningitis, which you wouldn't be able to see on CT. You could see some optic nerve involvement, orbital involvement, uh, involvement of the um, carotid canals potentially that you wouldn't be able to see on CT. Um, and then kind of moving uh, down further, um, obviously uh, x-rays down at the bottom, but you'd really want to get, uh, if you're worried about complicated sinusitis, you'd really want to get your CT with contrast and kind of the same thing with your MR. And then finally, um, with uh, immuno with deficient patients, um, that changes things a little bit as well, but this is kind of similar to the complicated uh, uh, ACR criteria, except that with your CT paranasal sinuses, you would get that without, uh, without contrast. So talking a little bit about uh, imaging features of allergic versus infectious sinus disease, so uh, we get this a lot. Um, where we, we know there's sinus disease there, there's some type of mucosal thickening, um, but we are not sure if uh, this is due to an allergic uh, etiology or infectious. So there's a couple things that we, we look at uh, as radiologists that kind of sways us in one, one direction or the other. So if uh, we see kind of this more um, mucosal thickening with kind of a scalloped appearance, it's kind of a little bit wavy, if you will, um, with no fluid levels, uh, and you see maybe some swollen turbinates, uh, maybe some uh, polyps within the sinuses, or um, we're thinking it's a little bit more of an allergic uh, type picture. And if you're getting multiple images on multiple days, uh, allergic sinusitis is, uh, it can vary day to day. So uh, I've had um, you know, one image where these sinuses looked completely normal, and literally the next day uh, you could see a significant amount of mucosal thickening. So um, that would kind of point us more towards allergic. Uh, the infectious sinus diseases, um, the big thing that we look at are the fluid levels, and that's why I've highlighted that there. So if we see fluid levels, if we're seeing secretions that we describe as frothy, um, it's kind of hard to describe it. It's really obvious and easy when you see it. Um, but when we see kind of frothy secretions with some fluid levels, um, in that case, we uh, kind of point a little bit more towards an infectious etiology. And uh, we're usually mentioning that in our impression saying, might want to evaluate for some type of uh, infectious uh, etiology there. So uh, acute sinusitis here, uh, we've got the axial and coronal images, axial on the left and coronal on the right. Um, you can see that there is all of these arrows right here. So uh, there is pretty much pan sinusitis right here. So you can see uh, sphenoid sinus, uh, mucosal thickening, all the ethmoid sinuses here, mucosal thickening. Uh, you can see that the uh, maxillary sinuses, you've got thickening on both sides. Um, and this is uh, more of a uh, infectious picture. So we, we have this uh, fluid, air fluid level right here. So you'll see, um, you know, when there's a little bit of mucosal thickening, you'll see kind of just this kind of thin rim or wall kind of around it uh, with just uh, kind of some mild mucosal thickening. But when you see a significant amount of uh, opacification with this kind of straight line, uh, that's an air fluid level. And you can kind of see maybe a little bit right here that there's just this like weird kind of um, undulating, oops, sorry, undulating kind of pattern right here in the sphenoid sinuses. This is kind of something that we say is a little bit more frothy uh, type of secretion. So um, both of those combined kind of gives us a, a picture of uh, infectious sinusitis. So talking a little bit about allergic fungal sinusitis, um, these are more kind of commonly seen in immunocompetent patients. Uh, these are going to affect multiple sinuses. Usually the ethmoids are, are uh, more common. You can get extension into the orbit, uh, into the intracranially as well. Um, the big thing with allergic fungal sinusitis is this hyperdense material centrally um, with kind of more of a hypodense rim of mucosa. Um, and you might see, uh, not you might, you will see some expansion of the sinuses, um, but you may or may not see some bony remodeling or erosion. And then finally, um, some non-invasive allergic fungal sinusitis. So this is the most common form of 
fungal sinusitis. Uh, this is hypersensitivity. You have inhaled fungal organisms more often than not. It'll be aspergillus. You can have fusarium. Um, those are kind of more of the uh, common ones. Um, and this is usually in younger adults, um, again, in immunocompetent patients. Um, this is uh, obviously in the name uh, non-invasive. It's different to uh, from invasive, um, which is seen in more immunocompromised patients or poorly controlled diabetics. And that'll be more of like uh, mucormycosis is kind of the more common thing that we see with that. So non-invasive. Um, You'll see, uh, um, as we mentioned, so uh, expansion of the uh, perinasal sinuses, so these ethmoid sinuses really expanded the maxillary sinuses. You can see they're a lot larger. There's a little bit thinning of the cortex uh, around the maxillary sinus as well and the ethmoid sinuses. You can see that's a little bit thinner than the uh, orbital walls right here. And usually the orbital wall will be uh, kind of consistent in, in terms of how, how thick it is with the you know, the medial orbital wall right by the ethmoid sinuses and the superior uh, or inferior orbital wall with the superior maxillary uh, sinus. Um, so there's thinning there, there's expansion, and then you can see this really hyperdense material within the uh, uh, sinuses, ethmoids and maxillary sinuses. So those two things kind of lead us more down the route of a non-invasive type of fungal sinusitis. So complications of uh, sinusitis we talked about a little bit before. Um, you can get subperiosteal abscesses, uh, orbital extension, uh, or you can get uh, epidural abscesses and, or meningitis. And the last thing would be venous sinus thrombosis. And so um, this was actually a, um, a case that I had uh, just this past um, week or two uh, where a patient had this unexplained um, cavernous sinus thrombosis, um, and there wasn't really any other reason as to why the patient might have it, um, but they did have some significant uh, paranasal sinus disease, so we kind of raised the question that uh, it could be uh, the cause of that uh, cavernous sinus thrombosis. Kind of a sad case with cavernous sinus thrombosis, but it, it is a thing. It's a little bit less common than some of these other uh, complications. Um, but it's still uh, a very severe, uh, serious one. So on this image right here, uh, it's a coronal image. Um, you can see the uh, right maxillary sinus pretty open. Right ethmoids are, look pretty good as well. Um, you can obviously tell there's a difference between the left ethmoid, the left maxillary sinuses. There's some really, really bad um, kind of hyperdense uh, mucosal thickening, kind of some frothy secretions in the left maxillary sinus there. Um, so uh, just to give a little background uh, on this patient, this is a diabetic patient, um, had a mucormycosis infection, so um, this would be a little bit more of an invasive picture. Um, you can see that they're kind of that infraorbital canal where you see this open arrow right here. There's a defect there that shouldn't be open, um, but because there was that uh, kind of destruction, osseous destruction of the superior maxillary sinus slash inferior orbital wall, um, that kind of allowed a direct extension of this infection into the orbit. And so you can see that um, here we have kind of the normal globe on the uh, right side. You have the medial, inferior, uh, superior rectus muscles. Here on this side, you can see that there's just this rim enhancing collections within the, um, within the uh, left orbit. So there's a uh, abscesses, intraorbital abscesses uh, on this left side. So pretty, pretty bad, pretty serious. Um, okay, uh, next case, a 16-year-old male, history of chronic sinusitis and uh, new onset seizures. So um, he's got sinusitis. Now he's got some potential intracranial involvement. Could be um, related to each other, might not be. Um, but you uh, definitely want to look at this a little bit further. So you're not going to get an x-ray on this on this kid. You're going to want to get a CT, and more likely we'll uh, proceed with, uh, with MR as well because it's more of a complicated sinusitis picture. So as you can see on CT, he's got um, pretty uh, significant left paranasal sinus disease. You can see the left maxillary sinus right here is um, 
opacified. The right looks normal. Uh, up here on this image on the top left, you can see the bilateral frontal sinuses are opacified. So he's got some sinus disease there. Uh, and then we have a CT head. And so um, you might look at this and say, all right, this looks pretty normal to me. And I wouldn't blame anyone for really saying that. But um, we look at a lot with uh, symmetry on, on the brain. So you can see right here, kind of along the midline falcs, uh, this uh, brain parenchyma is normal. You have this kind of normal gray-white interface right here. On the left side, this is a little bit hypodense compared to the right side. And you can see this maybe trace little hyperdensity kind of surrounding this area as well. Um, so that kind of raises the question that there, uh, there might be a little bit of uh, something going on along the uh, medial frontal lobes right there. Um, so same patient, uh, we ended up, uh, they ended up getting an MR. Um, so you can see this fluid sensitive sensitivity increased uh, uh, signal along the midline falx, like we pointed at on the uh, previous uh, CT. Um, you can really see that right there. Uh, the there's a hypodensity on this contrast enhanced image, um, and there is a rim enhancing uh, component to it, and so. Uh, anytime we see kind of a, a low uh, intense signal with rim enhancement, uh, there's a huge differential, but in this case, uh, this would be concerning for uh, intracranial abscess. Um, and you can also see that kind of along the uh, sulci uh, right here, there's just like all of this is really dense kind of along the sulci. And so um, that's kind of where the PIA mater is. And um, in this uh, uh, location, uh, that's that's where the leptin meninges are, and so that's a really common thing that you see with meningitis is uh, what we call leptin meningeal enhancement. So uh, there's enhancement of uh, of these leptin meninges, the pia, kind of in between the uh, the sulci within the gyri. So just a overview on uh, sinus imaging. Uh, You'll want to get this if there's failed medical therapy. If they have chronic sinusitis and they're planning surgery, you can always get a CT paranasal sinus to help the surgeons uh, figure out their approach. Um, and then, obviously, with uh, complicated sinusitis, you'll get CT or MR. Uh, initially, you'll want to get a CT, um, and you'll want to order the CT if it's a non-complicated patient. You'll want to get that uh, CT paranasal sinus without contrast. Um, and then... If they've got chronic recurrent complicated sinusitis, you can uh, add contrast. Uh, you would want to get a CT head along with that. Um, and then if we are really seeing some stuff on the CT, then uh, we'll probably jump to uh, MRI with contrast if you're concerned for more uh, more complicated uh, with extension into the orbits of the or the uh, brain. Okay, so moving on from the sinuses and uh, hit, hitting the uh, airway. So um, just a quick breakdown of the airway. You've got your trachea. Oh, whoops, sorry. You have your trachea. You have your right main stem bronchi, your secondary, tertiary bron bronchi, all the way down to the segmental um, bronchus. And then you have the proximal uh, and uh, terminal bronchioles. And then within the terminal bronchioles, you break down into the respiratory bronchioles, and that's kind of where your alveoli start, and that'll branch off into your uh, kind of terminal uh, ductal units um, with the uh, alveol alveoli sac, um, those little kind of cul-de-sacs, as I like to call them. So uh, first case um, is a 21-month-old male. Uh, noticed that uh, the mother noticed that uh, the patient was wheezing after picking him up from daycare. And so um, wheezing, uh, first uh, step would be to get a, a chest radiograph. Um, and so we have a frontal view here. Um, and you can see on the frontal view, um, you know, you might call this uh, normal uh, on this frontal view. But uh, if you look at it a little bit closely, you know, symmetry between the, the lungs on either side, you can see that this lung is either got some opacities or this lung is a little bit more uh, hyperlucent. So they're definitely off between the two. Um, in the setting of uh, wheezing, um, it can be helpful uh, to place the patient in a uh, decubitus position. So um, 
this kind of looks a little bit more aerated and it looks a bit, little bit uh, more lucent. So uh, you put this patient in right lateral decubitus, which means the right side's down. And you can see that there's like even more uh, pronounced aeration or lucency of the right lung. And so what this tells us is that there's a, a little bit of air trapping going on right there. Um, and what happened here is that uh, the patient um, uh, ended up swallowing a foreign body, which was not uh, radio dense. Uh, I believe in this case it was an apple. And so an apple doesn't really show very well on a radiograph. So uh, you can't see that the kid aspirated this apple into his right main stem bronchus, but he did. And uh, it's basically causing a plug up. Uh, which is causing that air to trap. So decubitus position can kind of be helpful in that sense. So aspirated foreign body um, can be acute, can be indolent. Usually, uh, in most cases, it's acute, uh, and it can mimic asthma, so it can have some wheezing. Um, obviously, if it's a more of, of acute uh, picture, then um, you're kind of thinking the more uh, worrisome causes, which uh, foreign body would be would be one of them. So moving on into laryngomalacia and tracheobronchomalacia. Um, so on both of these images, these are uh, frontal views, um, and you can see that uh, right here, uh, there's significant narrowing of the uh, larynx uh, and um, with a little bit of dilation of the, uh, the trachea. Um, and you can see here that there's uh, um, narrowing uh, of the of the larynx as well, but there's also narrowing of the uh, trachea, oh, whoops, of the trachea right right here as well. So laryngo um, malacia and trachea uh, bronchomalacia, um, the malacias really themselves are the kind of the most common uh, congenital uh, central airway abnormalities. Um, and what usually happens is that it presents as a little bit of an atrophy, so causing the um, smooth muscle layer within the trachea or the main stem bronchi uh, to be uh, a little bit more thinned. Um, and if there is thinning, then that smooth muscle layer can't, uh, I guess, keep the uh, airway open, so uh, it'll kind of collapse on itself. And so um, what that presents as is uh, an increased tracheal diameter um, with a tendency to collapse on expiration. So you have primary and secondary uh, malacias. Uh, won't get uh, super in-depth on those, but um, the radiographs are uh, okay at, at showing it, but again, CT is going to be really good at um, at showing the anatomy um, up and down throughout the trachea and bronchi. So, as we can see here, uh, primary tracheomalacia, uh, tracheobronchomalacia. Um, we've got uh, uh, lateral views of the patient um, when they're inspiring and on expiration as well. So on inspiration, you can see where those arrows are pointing. The trachea looks pretty normal. Um, on the expiration, you can't see the trachea anymore. And on expiration, you should still be able to see the trachea. Um, but in this case, the, uh, the column is just completely collapsed. So, and this is just a CT image, an axial image right here. So trachea is actually, it looks a little bit large. You wouldn't be able to tell that if you just had this image on its own. Um, but this was on inspiration. This patient is, uh, uh, this is on expiration. So they're breathing out. And you can see that the uh, trachea is really collapsed right here. And this is the esophagus. Um, and a good way to, uh, to define that, uh, if there's malacia, is you have a a uh, 70% decrease in the cross-sectional area on expiration. So with normal expiration, you'll have a little bit of collapse of the trachea, especially below the tracheal rings, um, where there's no uh, posterior um, uh, reinforcement of the trachea. Um, when it's kind of just that smooth muscle component posteriorly, uh, you'll have a little bit of um, collapse of the trachea. But if it's greater than it's like 50 to 70%, 
Um, usually we kind of use that 70% uh, as like the, the cutoff cutoff. Um, if there's more, uh, more than that of collapse, then, um, you know, you're, you're looking at uh, tracheal malacia. So you can see this is clearly more than 70%. And uh, when you see enough of, of these uh, tracheas, um, this one actually does look uh, pretty dilated on the inspiration. And then this is just an image right here, uh, a coronal image of uh, tracheobronchomalacia. So um, here on inspiration, this uh, left main stem bronchus looks uh, fairly open. On expiration, there's just complete collapse uh, of the left main stem. So asthma. Asthma is a big thing. Um, obviously, you guys know the uh, algorithm and uh, how to work these up a little bit better, but uh, this graphic was just a little bit helpful for me. Um, we don't necessarily need to uh, uh, talk about that. Um, imaging, uh, generally the first step in imaging for asthma and a lot of the subsequent steps are a uh, chest radiograph. Um, and that's just to make sure that there's no uh, infectious etiology as these do present very similarly. Um, if uh, there are any significant abnormalities on CT, uh, sorry, on, on a chest radiograph, uh, CT can be obtained uh, to get a better uh, delineation of that. So some indications. Um, if they're, uh, obviously, if they've got some respiratory uh, difficulties, but uh, some of the other indications are if there's uh, any um, fever, uh, any uh, abnormalities on on uh, ECG. Uh, hopefully these, these kids aren't uh, using any IV drugs, but um, if there's any IV drug use in utero, uh, can kind of bleed over into um, infant and young, young life. Uh, seizures, uh, immunosuppression uh, obviously can cause uh, or have some uh, intrathoracic uh, abnormalities. Other lung diseases, um, if they've had any prior uh, uh, surgery in the thorax, uh, if there's any worry for pneumothorax or just a patient in the, in the ICU. So the common imaging findings in asthma, um, and you'll find out uh, with chest uh, radiographs, chest radiography, uh, it's very, very nonspecific. Um, so not only could it be normal, you could see some findings which uh, the differential is pages and pages long. Um, obviously the common things being most common, but there are a couple of things that are uh, that are pretty common uh, which we raise suspicion for in asthma, and that is bronchial wall thickening or peribronchial cuffing. Um, and that term basically means uh, when you know, you're looking at a radiograph, uh, say if you're looking at a frontal radiograph, sometimes you can see these bronchi uh, on FOSS, meaning that uh, they're projecting out towards the uh, the image detector, and so you're kind of seeing this hole where the bronchus is, and if there's increased uh, opacification around that bronchus, uh, more so than you would normally expect, um, we call that peribronchial cuffing or bronchial wall thickening, um, and that's one of those things, especially in kids, that we raise a suspicion for asthma. Um, you might see some hyperinflation as well. Um, some of the uh, complications of asthma, you can see some atelectasis, so uh, collapse of certain areas of the lung, uh, which can be due to mucus plugging. Um, you can see spontaneous pneumothorax or pneumomediastinum, and then uh, obviously uh, pneumonia can be a uh, sequel of it as, as well. So on this image right here, um, obviously right off the bat we can tell that uh, these lungs don't look normal. Um, so. What we can see here is that the on, the, on this frontal view, um, the lungs are really hyperinflated, um, and we can see a little bit better on the lateral, but these, uh, the diaphragms, uh, well, the diaphragm, both hemidiaphragms are flattened. Uh, you can see that there's an abnormal AP diameter of the chest. There's widening of this um, retrosternal uh, clear space. Usually this should be a little bit more like that, but it's widened. Um, the uh, chest just kind of looks more barrel chested, if you will. Um, and then there's just these diffuse uh, reticular uh, heterogeneous and reticular opacities just all around the lungs uh, right here. So, you know, you might think maybe there's a pneumonia picture or asthma or um, 
you know, pulmonary edema of some sort. Um, on this uh, image right here, uh, I was mentioning to you before, but here is a uh, bronchus right here kind of coming out. And you can see that there's this kind of central component right here, which is uh, the actual airway itself. Um, but there's really uh, marked thickening around that airway. And so this is what we call bron bronchial wall thickening or peribronchial cuffing. So moving on to bronchiectasis, um, uh, bronchiectasis is a irreversible dilation of the bronchus or uh, bronchi. Um, oftentimes you'll see bronchial wall thickening with it. Um, so to be able to call bronchiectasis, uh, there's two main things that we, we look at. One is an increased bronchi bronchoarterial ratio, and that's greater than one. So the, the bronchi and the, uh, the peribronchial arteries should be roughly the same size. More often than not, uh, as you move further out, the bronchi themselves or the bronchioles will taper in size and they'll, that ratio will be less than one. Um, if the bronchi are larger than one and they remain larger um, throughout their course, then uh, that's something that we uh, think of uh, bronchiectasis. Um, and then another thing that I use, which um, I, I think the chest uh, radiologists uh, here also um, kind of harp on, is if you, uh, especially on a CT, if you're able to see a bronchus uh, within one centimeter of the pleural surface, then uh, that in itself could be a defining feature of bronchiectasis. So uh, as those bronchi move forward, they taper, they get smaller. You should not see a bronchus at the very edge of a lung, um, but if you are uh, able to see it within one centimeter of the uh, uh, pleural surface, then uh, that would be a defining feature. Um, there's a couple of different uh, variants. Um, uh, some of the more common ones are cylindrical uh, or uh, varicose or cystic uh, variant. And so cylindrical you'll see more often uh, in patients with asthma, um, and then varicose or cystic is more often an ABPA or allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. And this is just a little bit of a, uh, a graphic. So uh, normal bronchus tapers as it goes. Cylindrical, that stays pretty wide open. A varicose uh, kind of gives that varicose uh, um, appearance like varicose veins and then these cystic kind of like uh, uh, globular appearance of, of the bronchi. So uh, bronchiectasis um, is, at least as, uh, as radiologists, we uh, define um, our differential based on which uh, lung zone they're affecting. So you can have an upper, mid, or a lower lung zone predominant bronchiectasis. And so upper, lung, upper lobe predominance, uh, we're looking at mainly cystic fibrosis or ABPA. Um, middle and lingula, um, that's kind of uh, one of our uh, classic uh, indications that we're looking at, kind of a, a non-tuberculous non uh, mycobacterial infection like MAC. Um, that's actually one thing that if, you know, if we're seeing bronchiectasis in the middle uh, lobes or in the lingula, we'll pretty much say it is MAC until proven otherwise. So. Um, that's one of those easy ones to remember. And then lower low predominance, um, those you can see with uh, viral infections, uh, obviously chronic aspiration um, uh, can cause that bronchiectasis. And then uh, some of the more uh, less common ones, but the uh, more um, board testable ones are uh, uh, primary cellular dyskinesia or cartagenors or uh, some other types of immunodeficiencies. So here um, you can see that um, we have a coronal uh, CT. This is a maximal intensity projection image. It really gives you a good look at the uh, pulmonary uh, vessels and the bronchi. Um, but you can see that there are bilateral um, dilated bronchi with uh, mucoid impactions. Um, we can see some tree and bud opacities. So, um, uh, Right here, uh, that's uh, what we call tree and bud opacities. Um, and uh, where, where this curved arrow is right here, uh, we have a bronchus right here. And this is kind of a little bit more of like a varicose or uh, cystic kind of dilation of the bronchus. But that should be all open. Uh, and that is just completely impacted uh, with mucus right there. And down here, you can see there's this pretty enlarged uh, uh, bronchus right here. And if I were to measure from here to here, 
Uh, it might be a little bit over a centimeter. Um, that's probably about 1.5 centimeters from the pleural surface, but uh, there's no way that that, that bronchus is going to terminate uh, or taper down within that one centimeter. So you can kind of use that as a, as a clue right there that you're looking at bronchiectasis. Here's just another example of the bronchial, art, uh, bronchial arterial ratio. So normal on the left side, you've got a bronchus right here. you got the uh, adjacent arterial. Uh, those are roughly the same size, if not smaller for the bronchus. Same thing right here and here. Uh, on this side, uh, you have markedly dilated bronchioles so, or bronchi. So this right here is a bronchus, and this right here and this right here are adjacent vessels. Same thing right here with an adjacent vessel. The bronchus is considerably larger uh, than the vessel. So that ratio is greater than one, and that would be a, a diagnostic criteria to say that there is uh, bronchial uh, uh, bronchiectasis. Um, and uh, there's always a signet ring sign everywhere in every part of the body. So I don't like using signet ring sign uh, for this just because it can be very confusing as to what you're talking about. I just say that there's uh, bronchiectasis with an increased uh, bronchial alveolar or arterial or ratio. Um, and then here is a, a pretty interesting case, not very common. Um, you can obviously see that there's bronchiectasis of the left lung. Uh, the right lung looks relatively normal compared to the left lung. Um, but uh, something that we're looking at here is that uh, we have a right-sided heart. Uh, we have a right-sided aortic arch. We have uh, bronchiectasis. We know we're, we're in the mid to lower lung zone, predominantly lower lung zone, because we can see all four chambers of the heart right here. Um, and uh, uh, as we talked about earlier, with uh, some of the lower lung zone uh, predominant etiologies, there was uh, viral infections. Um, you had uh, aspiration, bronchiectasis, um, but we also mentioned primary ciliary dyskinesia. So uh, with bronchiectasis and the setting of a right uh, dextrocardia and a right-sided aortic arch, uh, this is kind of pointing more towards cartagenors. Uh, other things that you would want to look at uh, with cartagenors, uh, you will see um, some hearing loss, uh, nasal polyposis, uh, and infertility as well, and because it's affecting the cilia, it's really affecting any of those organs that have cilia in them. So, here's just a good example of mucus plugging. So, we, this is a really good image of of a bronchus, um, main bronchus. It's kind of uh, going through its divisions, tapering down. You have a little bit of a mucus uh, impaction in in this uh, kind of secondary bronchus, and then and kind of when we get down to this tertiary bronchus, there's just this very obvious mucus plug uh, right here. Um, what was I talking about on this one? Okay. Um, so uh, we talked about how uh, bronchiectasis, um, you can uh, get associated atelectasis. You get so much bronchiectasis over time that that lung collapses. So in this case, uh, we're looking at a frontal view chest radiograph. Uh, there's just some kind of uh, ill-defined kind of reticular opacities bilaterally. Um, but uh, down here, we kind of lose this border of the heart a little bit. Um, here you can see a really well-defined left heart border. On this side, we kind of lose it a little bit right here. So uh, we're dealing with a right middle lobe atelectasis. Um, you can see this kind of dilated um, bronchus right here. Uh, so we've got a little bit of bronchiectasis with right middle lobe atelectasis. So moving on a uh, little bit smaller in the bronchi, um, talking about the bronchioles, uh, a very common thing that we see is a bronchiolitis. Um, so uh, what this will show up as is uh, mosaic attenuation on uh, inspiration and air trapping on expiration. Um, and so whenever we see uh, bronchiolitis, uh, uh, we will oftentimes see uh, tree and bud opacities as well. Um, and that's uh, something that I pointed out previously on, on that CT uh, before. Um, excuse me. Um, so tree and bud opacities with a mosaic attenuation uh, and air trapping. Um, this is kind of thinking a little bit more of like an infectious uh, process. So um, associated with uh, 
asthma related hospitalization, really just any hospitalization uh, with mechanical ventilation uh, and ICU admission. So really all of those are just kind of uh, associated with each other. So here's an example of air trapping. We have a uh, axial image, a CT of the upper lung zones here. Um, and so you can see these kind of scattered areas of mosaic attenuation. Um, and whenever we see mosaic atten attenuation, we're really thinking small airway disease, so the bronchi bronchioles themselves. So um, uh, what might be a little bit confusing on this one is that, uh, first off, uh, one thing that we always look at is, uh, is this patient in their inspiratory phase or their expiratory phase? And as we were talking about before with uh, tracheobronco tracheobronchomalacia, um, with that ratio, uh, remember in this kind of, uh, uh, the tra inferior trachea below the cartilage rings uh, on expiration, you can see this kind of um, indentation of the posterior trachea where that smooth muscle is kind of uh, collapsing a little bit. Uh, this is not tracheomalacia because we don't have uh, greater than 70%. Uh, obviously, we don't have the inspiratory image to compare to, but you can just see this is kind of so well patent, well open. Um, but this is the expiratory phase, and so you can see some air trapping on the expiratory phase. So uh, what you might think is abnormal lung in this case is actually normal lung. So you can see this kind of uh, these areas that are a little bit more opacified in the bilateral lungs right there, right there, right here, out here, here. That's actually normal uh, expired lung. What the abnormal part is, is this little wedge right here and kind of down here, that is air trapping. And so that you'll see that on the, on the expiratory phase. So it's kind of important to compare the inspiratory with the expiratory phases. Uh, sometimes you just get the one image and it's inspiratory or expiratory and you just kind of have to make a call and uh, kind of say what you say, see what you see. Um, oftentimes whenever they're getting these CTs, they're not only getting kind of a normal um, axial image, but they're getting uh, maximal intensity projection images. They're getting you know different uh, images with it. And so sometimes you'll be able to get an inspiratory image and an expiratory image, and you can really compare the two between uh, between themselves. Air trapping. Uh, this is just a little bit of a graphic um, with uh, these kind of terminal um, lobules here. So uh, you get this uh, terminal uh, bronchus, the bronchioles. Those are kind of branching, and then uh, kind of in that last little uh, last little bit, you have this uh, the the um, sac with, uh, with, with the uh, alveoli. Um, and that's kind of what we're seeing here on this image uh, after these two branch. Um, you're getting different uh, terminal kind of lobules. So let's see here. All right, so um, a uh, common complication, well, not common complication, but a, a significant compl complication of um, uh, ruptured alveoli is a uh, spontaneous pneumomediastinum or spontaneous pneumothorax. Um, basically what's happening is that the alveoli are, are popping um, and then you're just getting air which is dissecting kind of along those uh, uh, back up the uh, the airway, the peribronchovascular sheath um, and it's really separating the uh, interlobular septa um, and extending back into the mediastinum. So on this image, you can see with this curved arrow over here, there's this uh, separation between the uh, pleura and the heart border with this abnormal line, um, which is a little bit of pneumomastinium. Um, sometimes um, when there's a difference in, um, if when there's kind of a border between the heart and the lung, there might be what's called this kind of uh, uh, ghost silhouette sign. I can't remember the name of it actually, but um, basically what happens is that you get this like kind of faint lucent line, which can look like a pneumomediastinum, um, but it's just because uh, it's kind of a border sign. That's what it is, the border sign. Um, There's just two different borders, two different interfaces, and it looks like it could be faint. Um, in this case, there is some significant pleural separation from the heart, left heart border and the uh, um, uh, you can see it tracking up and there's a little bit of lucency kind of up here 
in the upper mediastinum. So if you're kind of seeing that along with that, then uh, that's a little bit more worrisome for a, for a pneumo mediastinum. Uh, so next up is uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So um, it's an allergic inflammatory response of the uh, lung parenchyma. Um, can be due to a lot of different things. Um, it's usually associated with IgG and IgM, um, and they are named in the setting for which they occur. Uh, I hate eponyms because they don't ever tell me what I need to know, but I think these are really funny. Bird fancier's lungs, mushroom worker's lungs, hot tub lung. Sounds like something that wouldn't be too bad to get, at least if you're relaxing in a hot tub. Um, but uh, they're basically, they uh, were, are really separated into two different clusters. So you have a cluster one and a cluster two, and cluster one was uh, previously, uh, uh, was previously called acute and subacute hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Um, mainly you'll see mid to lower lung zone uh, consolidations um, on a high resolution CT. Uh, that's kind of what we, we use for looking at uh, interstitial lung diseases. We can also uh, utilize a high resolution CT to look at hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Um, high resolution is not something that you'll ever really want to order. Um, generally, you'll want to just get like a regular CT uh, without contrast for most things. Uh, obviously, if there's um, some mass or if there's a, uh, if you're worried about some type of malignancy or if you're worried about some vascular issues, then you'll get it with contrast. But majority of the studies that you guys will order are uh, CT without contrast. But uh, if you're starting to worry about uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis or interstitial lung diseases, um, then a high resolution CT uh, is uh, the preferred test to order. And usually the radiologist, uh, when they initially read the uh, normal CT chest without contrast, they will uh, make a recommendation to, to get a high resolution CT. So, um, but the uh, high resolution CT is done kind of normal axial, like you normally see normal CTs, but they also do uh, prone imaging as well. Um, and that's because certain things can look different, uh, supine versus prone. Um, but, but in these cluster one hypersensitivity pneumonitis, uh, you'll see bilateral airspace consolidations. Um, you'll see patchy ground glass opacities, uh, small ill-defined central lobular nodules, um, and then mosaic attenuation. And we'll kind of show you kind of what some of these things look like. Uh, we already talked about mosaic attenuation and ground glass opacities uh, previously with the uh, with that air trapping image that I showed you. Um, so with these small nodules, uh, we differentiate or we throw out differential di uh, diagnoses based on their distribution. So you can have a random pattern, you can have central lobular, you can have perilymphatic as well. Um, on this image, it kind of gives you a look at what, what that looks like. So random, it'll be these tiny nodules kind of all spread out and no particular order uh, central lobular are going to be within these within these lobules oops within these lobules so um, you'll have them kind of either clustered uh, there um, uh, kind of in the middle of these lobules uh, and then perilymphatic is if they're kind of tracking along these inner lobular septa or tracking along the um, peribronchovascular um, uh, sheath. So we're going to go through a couple of different images here, and we'll kind of talk about which uh, which of these patients has hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So on this first image right here, what we have is um, we have more of a perilymphatic uh, distribution of these uh, tiny nodules. So you can see that they're kind of following these interlobular septa right here, here, you have these like tiny little nodules here along the um, bronchovascular sheaths. Um, so this would be more of a perilymphatic distribution. Um, and whenever we see perilymphatic distribution, uh, the first thing that we um, uh, raise a concern or question for is uh, lymphangitic carcinomatosis. So uh, due to uh, kind of a primary lung malignancy that's causing uh, perilymphatic spread. This one, this is more of a random pattern. Um, and this is just florid central lobular, or sorry, uh, random uh, 
small pulmonary nodules throughout the bilateral lungs. Um, this is more of a uh, case of miliary TB, these little pellets kind of all throughout the lungs. Not very common, but a pretty classic case. And then finally right here, uh, really grainy image, and I apologize, but you can see that there's just this uh, kind of small nodule right here. You got these small nodules here, here. Um, these are kind of more in that lobular distribution. So this is more of a central lobular uh, distribution, and uh, this is the one that you would kind of most associate with hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So in the acute setting, um, you will see uh, ground glass opacities uh, pretty much in all of these cases. Uh, you'll see central lobular ground glass nodules, uh, expiratory air trapping, the head cheese sign. I'll show you an image of that in a little bit. Kind of gross sounding, and it also looks really gross. Um, and then in the chronic setting, you'll see mid and upper lung zone fibrosis. So on this image, what we have here is um, a high-resolution CT. You can kind of see just like these uh, uh ground glass opacities just throughout the lungs. I mean, it just kind of looks mosaic in attenuation all throughout. Um, there's not a whole lot that um, that's really sticking out, but this is just all kind of mosaic uh, attenuation of the lungs. Really should be a lot more lucent. Uh, should be more kind of like the trachea, but you can see that it's not, it's not dark. It's a little bit more gray than, than uh, where this trachea is uh, branching off. So... And here's the, the head cheese sign. So um, it looks like head cheese, but basically you have um, air trapping. You've got all these central lobular nodules. You've got ground glass opacities. Um, and then you've got these more loosened areas, which are areas of, of air trapping right here. So this um, kind of looks a little bit similar and uh, to something else that we'll talk about here in a second. Um, with uh, some this this other etiology, um, oh, this is just a, a picture of, of head cheese. I don't know if you guys have had head cheese. I haven't, and I don't want to try it, um, but it really looks like it. Cluster two. So this is um, a little bit more chronic. Um, you have fibrosis. It takes months or years to develop. Um, so this you can see uh, since it's a spectrum, you can see. Uh, superimposed cluster one findings uh, with cluster two. Um, so not only will, could you see central ovular distribution, uh, central ovular nodules, mosaic attenuation, uh, that head cheese sign, um, if you will, um, but you'll also kind of start to see some of these more uh, chronic findings, like you'll see reticulations, honeycombing, uh, ar architectural distortion, uh, traction bronchiectasis as well. Um, usually when we mention honeycombing, we're talking about interstitial lung diseases, and that's what makes chest ra uh, radiology so difficult is that there's so much overlap in terms of imaging findings with one thing versus the other, but um, it can be very difficult to, uh, to tell if you're looking at something that's like a uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, chronic picture versus a, an idiopathic interstitial lung disease. And those two things really carry so much weight in terms of, of the diagnosis because on one end with, you know, chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, you know, you know, patients can, you know, kind of have that and live with that. But, you know, if you give someone an idiopathic interstitial uh, lung disease uh, diagnosis, they're pretty much, you know, sentenced to an irreversible disease process that they're going to die from very shortly. So it's difficult to make the call between the two, um, but they have very uh, a lot of overlapping features. And so prior imaging can be very, very helpful uh, in determining uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis versus an interstitial lung disease. So this is an image of chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Really bad picture. You've got this upper mid lung zone predominance. You have really just, I mean, it's just you have opacities all around central lobular nodules. You have architectural distortion of the um, mid and upper lung zones. This is the middle lobe right here, and it's just more collapsed, um, and that's kind of more due to uh, some 
uh, attraction bronchiectasis, uh, where the bronchi um, are so dilated and you can see that kind of in the upper lobe that it's kind of pulling on the interlobular septa um, kind of causing this this distortion of the uh, of the lungs themselves but not a great image in terms of quality but it, it, it kind of displays chronic uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis pretty well next is uh, let's see here okay yeah um, so kind of associated with hypersensitivity pneumonitis uh, and something that we always throw in the differential when we see both of these is uh, eosinophilic pneumonia. Um, so you can see here um, on this image, you've got just these bilateral heterogeneous opacities, kind of a little bit more peripheral predominant. Uh, and normally with... Um, uh, with eosinophilic pneumonia or hypersensitivity pneumonitis, you'll see more peripheral predominance. Um, this is kind of like the opposite, if you will, of like a uh, um, like heart failure with pulmonary edema. You kind of see, I don't know if you guys have heard of like the bat wing appearance um, with like globular appearance of the, of the heart, but that would be kind of like more of like an interstitial edema pattern. This, like the this is almost like a reverse. So this is actually kind of a little bit more normal looking right here, kind of peri hyler and kind of more central, um, at least on the right lung here. But you can kind of see that like a little bit further out, this is all a little bit more involved. And then out here, this is all a little bit more involved as well. So um, uh, acute eosinophilic, eosinophilic pneumonia is not something that we ever diagnose on imaging alone. Uh, and obviously you uh, uh, want to take a look at, you know, peripheral smears. Um, the diagnostic test of choice is, is a bronchialveolar or lavage. Um, and so, you know, we, us reading this, we would say, you know, bilateral diffuse heterogeneous opacities with peripheral predominance. Um, I'd say maybe mid and lower lung zone predominance as well. Um, and, you know, we, we wouldn't, I would never really say this is acute eosinophilic pneumonia right off the bat if I'm reading this for the first time. On uh, this axial CT right here, um, you'll see these uh, ground glass opacities with interlobular septal thickening. So here's some of the ground glass opacities that you have here. These interlobular septa where this arrow is pointing, pointing to, these really shouldn't be this thick this far out. So you have uh, um, inter interlobular septal thickening uh, along with that. Um, and some of these um, pertinent negatives um, is that uh, you won't see any pericardial effusions, no cardiomegaly. You're not going to see any lymphadenopathy either. So um, this is actually really um, important, especially now. Um, also, uh, just a quick mention that you might see these in a report. Whoops. Um, so this interlobular septal thickening, uh, sometimes it's described as a crazy paving pattern. Um, they just kind of look like uh, you know, little streets kind of running along. So um, sometimes they call that a crazy paving pattern. Um, also back here, you do see some uh, small bilateral pleural effusions uh, in the posterior lung bases right here, or posterior lungs. Um, and that, that is something that you can see with uh, acute eosinophilic pneumonia. Um, but uh, so mentioning these ground glass opacities, which are peripheral predominant, you have this interlobular septal thickening with crazy paving, and you can have these uh, peripheral um, uh, opacities. So uh, here on this chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, you have this peripheral um, opacity here, a chest radiograph on the left, and on this uh, coronal CT chest um, on the right side, you can see this consolidation in the right upper lung zone um, here, which corresponds to this spot right here. Um, and so um, the important thing to note about this is that uh, with hypersensitivity pneumonitis, with chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, these look very similar to um, organizing pneumonia as well infectious uh, organizing pneumonia. And the reason why I mentioned that is because COVID infection looks exactly like that. So if you ever see, if you ever get any patients coming in with a, a COVID infection and they've got really bad junky lungs, uh, take a look at the report um, in the findings and you'll see that they'll describe it. If it's, if it's a typical pattern, they'll describe it as, you know, 
peripheral patchy ground glass opacities with consolidations with interlobular septal thickening in a crazy paving pattern. And you'll notice that that describes eosinophilic pneumonia and hypersensitivity pneumonitis pretty spot on. And so they, those are all kind of lumped together. So before COVID, you know, if someone had this picture, um, I would say to myself, you know, you know, there's, there are these findings, here's the differential. And I would throw those three things out as a differential. Now, during, you know, COVID, you know, we, we rarely ever throw out the differential of uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis or eosinophilic pneumonia. It's COVID until proven otherwise. And it's a very easy way to, to, to test that. You just, you know, you do a PCR testing and you figure out, do they have COVID or not? And if they don't, then you can kind of go down those other routes. But um, that was kind of the main thing that I wanted to point out on, on these images and these slides. Um, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, uh, ABPA. Um, you know, you can see this with asthma, cystic fibrosis. Um, you'll see kind of proximal bronchiectasis. Um, obviously, you'll have reactive skin tests with these. Um, so radi radiographic imaging, um, you're going to see some mucoid impaction. On CT, you'll see this kind of tubular finger and glove opacities in a bronchial distribution. Uh, you might see some areas of consolidation. Uh, you might see some tram tracking, which are uh, kind of thick-walled uh, central bronchiectatic airways. Um, you might see some pulmonary nodules, some pleural effusions, uh, or what have you. So um, the uh, this uh, patient here, um, you can obviously see the right lung is much more involved than the left lung, um, but uh, there's a middle lobe consolidation on the right. Um, you've got some central bronchiectasis. Um, you have uh, that arrow on the uh, left, the one pointing at the right upper lobe right here. This is kind of pointing at that central bronchiectasis. There is some peribronchial wall cuffing or peribronchial wall thickening. Um, and then here um, on the left upper lobe with this curved arrow, uh, there is this opacity right here. Uh, it's not well appreciated on the radiograph, but um, that is representing some mucoid impaction of a bronchus. And this is just an example of the finger and glove appearance. So there's this really dilated large uh, bronchus with a mucoid impaction, just mucus impaction, and it just kind of looks like a finger inside of a glove. Um, and then down here with this black arrow, you have a little bit of uh, air trapping. All right, so to finish this off, we'll talk about some uh, non-atopic respiratory mimics. Uh, foreign bodies in the ear canal. Um, so uh, uh, Arnold's nerve, uh, it's the auricular branch of the vagus nerve. Um, that kind of, uh, you know, we have a lot of nerves running uh, kind of in the inner slash middle ear canal. Um, but if you have any type of cerumen that's impacted within the ear, uh, it can compress that uh, uh, branch of the vagus nerve, um, the auricular branch. And uh, that's been shown to be a cause of cough. So uh, not every cough is chest-related. Not every cough is GERD-related. Um, it could be something, something as simple as a kid stuck something in his ear, and now he's coughing. Okay, so we'll talk about some of these anatomic variants. Really, uh, I'm not going to get the, to the rest of these, but we'll just mainly talk about some vascular anomalies here. Uh, and briefly touch on uh, tracheoesophageal fistula as well. Um, so vascular anomaly, uh, anomalies, um, you got your rings and your splings. Um, you uh, can sometimes see these on uh, just regular radiographs. Um, they're a little bit more difficult. Uh, the test of choice is still a CT, um, and that would be a CTA. Uh, so that's a CT angio, so they... Uh, you are giving the patient contrast, and they're imaging it while the contrast is within the arteries. Um, and then uh, you can also use esophagrams. Uh, esophagrams are, are pretty good at seeing uh, um, any anatomic abnormalities with the esophagus. Uh, it doesn't really localize or uh, show you the extent of the actual abnormality, though. So uh, vascular uh, rings. Um, you can have, uh, there's 
a multitude of, of vascular anomalies. Um, but with this kind of common one that can kind of cause uh, some symptoms is uh, this right-sided aortic arch um, with a, an aberrant left subclavian artery. And so you can see that that's kind of wrapping around a little bit posterior to the esophagus. Um, and a lot of times these are still associated with a um, either a uh, remnant of the ductus arteriosus or uh, with the ligamentum arteriosum, uh, which is just the uh, vestige of that ductus arteriosus. Um, and so you can see that there's this ring that kind of forms around both the trachea and the esophagus, and that can kind of cause some compression uh, of both of those structures. Um, and then you can get a double aortic arch as well, and we'll show you an image of that. So here on this uh, frontal radiograph, um, looks pretty normal uh, on first take. Um, if you uh, do look a little bit closely, you can see that the trachea is a little bit deviated to the left. Normally, the trachea is a little bit deviated to the right, so it would be kind of com coming down this way. Um, and uh, more often than not, uh, in normal anatomy, the right main stem bronchus kind of comes down, and the left main stem is a little bit more horizontal. In this case, the right and left main stem bronchi are actually both kind of coming straight down, so that's a little bit abnormal. Um, and then the most telling thing is that uh, normally you'll see uh, a left-sided aortic arch, and you'll see this kind of opacity of the arch kind of wrapping around down this way and coming down. Uh, in this case, we do not see uh, an aortic knob. We don't see an opacity on the left side of that aortic arch coming down on the left side. So um, these constellation of, constellation of findings kind of makes you question uh, if there's a, a uh, right-sided aortic arch or, or, a, or a vascular anomaly of some sort. So this is a, an esophagram. Um, basically, it's just a live fluoroscopic imaging, live x-rays, while a patient drinks contrast. Um, and so they're drinking contrast, and you can see that it's coming down into the esophagus. And on this frontal view, you can see this indentation to the right. So there is uh, the esophagus is kind of compressed on the right side. And here is a lateral uh, projection uh, might be an oblique, but it's it's to the side, and you can see that uh, normal esophagus right here, and then there's this posterior indentation of the esophagus. And as we talked about before, the left subclavian artery, the aberrant, will wrap posteriorly to the esophagus. So that's kind of what's causing that. And so the the right side of the esophagus was a little bit indented, and that was due to this uh, right-sided kind of uh, aortic arch. But then the aberrant left um, subclavian is uh, what's causing that compression more posteriorly. Uh, and this is, there's a bunch of CT images right here. Uh, this just demonstrates that you have a left, uh, aberrant left subclavian artery wrapping posterior to the esophagus. That is seen right here, a left subclavian on this coronal view right here. And then this little outpouching right here, you guys might have heard this term, uh, it's the diverticulum of Comoral. Um, but basically, it's just a it's just a uh, redundancy of that proximal left subclavian artery, um, uh, the proximal uh, aspect of the aberrant left subclavian artery. So, uh, and then here are some images of a, a double aortic arch. So you can see uh, on this frontal view radiograph, there's compression right here. There's compression right here of the trachea. Uh, these are fluoroscopic images. You can see both compression, uh, indentation of both sides of the esophagus, both anteriorly and posteriorly. On these contrast-enhanced CT images, you can see that there's contrast going through the aorta on both sides. So this is kind of the root of the aorta. This is moving up a little bit as it branches with the double aortic arch. And then these are both the comic rods and the subclavians branching off separately off of both of the uh, arches. And then finally, this image back here is a 3D reconstructed image of all of this that we're seeing. So you can see that there's the aorta, there is a double aortic arch right there. Uh, vascular slings. Um, so it's not quite a ring around um, like we saw with the vascular ring, this is due to an aberrant left pulmonary artery, more common than not. Um, again, there's a bunch of different variants, but this is the most common. Uh, and basically what happens is you've got the pulmonary trunk, which normally the pulmonary trunk uh, arises from the right ventricle, and you get a left pulmonary and a right pulmonary, and they branch uh, normally. In this case, 
the right pulmonary artery kind of continues on as the pulmonary trunk, and the left pulmonary artery is like, oh, wait, sorry, I got I to gotta branch off, and it branches off a little bit late, and it crosses back over. And in this case, it passes anterior to the esophagus, but still posterior to the trachea. So with that aberrant left subclavian, uh, we saw that there was a branch in it, went posterior to both the esophagus and the trachea. This one's kind of splitting the esophagus and the trachea. So as we see on this lateral fluoroscopic image, patients drinking some contrast, you can see there's an indentation of the esophagus anteriorly instead of posteriorly with uh, the left subclavian artery, uh, aberrant left subclavian artery. This one is more, post or more anterior, so this kind of leads more to an aberrant left pulmonary artery. Tracheoesophageal fistulas, um, the, there are many different types. These are five of the most common. Uh, uh, of these five, C is by far the most common, uh, where you have this uh, proximal diverticulum and this distal tracheoesophageal fistula. Um, the one that uh, is more relevant for, for you guys that can kind of cause symptoms of cough, uh, kind of more of these uh, uh, allergic symptoms, is uh, this H-type H -type, uh, tracheoesophageal fistula. Uh, this only accounts for about 10% of them, but you can see that there is uh, this esophagus, there is a fistula right between it, and if you can imagine it, it looks like an H. And that's just a fluoroscopic image of this as well. And so on this image, we have a, uh, a uh, uh, oblique uh, fluoroscopic uh, barium esophagram. Um, so they're drinking contrast, and you can actually see it with the esophagus kind of coursing normally, but there's still that fistula there. There should not be any contrast within the trachea, but since there's that fistula, you're seeing contrast there. And then finally, uh, a very, very common cause of cough, more so in adults than kids, is uh, gastroesophageal reflux. Um, you know, this is kind of one of those things, especially in kids, where you exhaust some of these other possibilities of cough. You do kind of your normal chest workup, and uh, they're refractory to some of this more uh, this medical man management for, say, asthma or, or what have you. Um, and uh, this is when you kind of look a little bit more into uh, gastroesophageal reflux. So um, the most sensitive, not the most specific, but the most sensitive uh, exam is uh, gastroesophageal scintigraphy. Um, you can also to use a, an, an esophagram or, or an upper GI. The upper GI is not terribly sensitive. Um, an esophagram is um, something that you can, uh, you can have them swallow some contrast and then ask them to do a Valsalva maneuver and you can see some reflux. Um, that's something very commonly done in adults and we do see gastroesophageal reflux there. But um, with uh, kids, can't really tell them to do a Valsalva they're either too young to, to understand it, or you'd probably be worried that they'd, uh, they'd uh, poop their pants or something. So um, in this case, uh, with children, gastroesophageal scintigraphy uh, is kind of the, the choice. Um, and basically what that is is you have them drink some technetium-99 sulfur colloid um, mixed with some other, some other uh, type of fluid. I think, I think they mix it with egg whites, um, so it's not really that great, but um, what happens is uh, that gives off kind of this uh, radiation um, that a, you have a special detector that picks up on this, this radiation, um, and the uh, imaging is done over a pretty lengthy time for about an hour, um, and then you get some more delayed images, and this is what it looks like. So uh, in this case, you've got uh, all of this kind of uh, technetium kind of in the stomach, and you've got a little bit of this technetium that's going back up into the esophagus, refluxing. Um, so that's enough to kind of call it. Um, in this case, after some of these delayed images, you can actually see there's a little bit of technetium outside of where this GI tract is in the lower lung bases. So this kind of leads us to think that maybe this kid aspirated potentially and uh, got some of that uh, radio tracer in their lungs. All right, that is it. You guys have any questions? If anybody has any questions, you can drop them in the chat or unmute and ask. Well, not, not seeing anything right now. Um, definitely a lot to take in. And like, like Dr. Portnoy said, you know, not, 
um, something that we get a, a ton of um, exposure to and and education on. So we really appreciate you um, being here, Dr. Aziz, to give us that presentation. And, um, you know, I think it, you know, big point in there is that, you know, there's um, a lot to consider, you know, in all of these diagnoses, um, you know, mimics and whatnot. So making sure that we always have that broad differential and in, in whatever we're working up, I think is, is another important takeaway point. Um, so I don't see anything coming through in the chat for questions. So I think we'll go ahead and wrap up today. But again, thanks for joining us and we appreciate your presentation. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. And um, again, sorry for uh, for running way over time and kind of delaying that, uh, the, the other lecture, which I'm sure was going to be phenomenal. But um, again, and thanks guys. And uh, hopefully you guys got something out of it. Yeah, definitely appreciate it. And uh, we made it work, so no worries. All awesome. right. Thank you. That concludes COLA for today, everybody. Thanks for joining us. And um, I believe that Monday is a holiday, and so we will not be having any COLA. So um, hopefully that's correct. But um, we'll plan on saying or um, having everybody join us again in a week on Friday. Thanks so much.